Hello everyone and welcome back to another exciting edition of the Shiny Developer Series. My name is Eric Nance and I'm always thrilled to have you joining us from wherever you are in the world. And that's a very appropriate term today, the entire world, because our next guest in the Shiny Developer Series is giving us a record for the longest distance between your trusty host here and our guest and it continuing our spotlight on recent contest submissions um, to the Shiny Contest held by our studio earlier this year. So it is my pleasure to welcome to the Shiny Developer Series from the land of Down Under, Kate Saunders. Kate, thanks for joining us today. Hi. Yes, it's nice to be able to join you all the way from Australia. It's, um, yeah, You're this world of online is pretty cool that we can be in two different places and be still having this chat so the magic of technology when it works it works well sometimes when it doesn't work that's a different story but um <laughs> certainly i'm very happy that you're able to take the time to talk with me today um so maybe you could tell our audience a little bit about yourself what do you do and how did you get started with r and and learn about shiny yeah, so um, I have a PhD in stats from the University of Melbourne, and um, I'm particularly interested in the field of kind of statistical climatology, so how we apply statistics to think about problems in the climate community. And as part of that, I'm really interested in how we understand like rare events or extreme events, so um, things we might not have seen before but we still need to kind of know the probability of this event happening. So that's my bread and butter. Um, and I was kind of a big enabler of that journey because that's how I fit all my statistical models. Uh, super important to me in that respect, how I can get a bunch of data, use a bunch of packages, all that kind of fabulous stuff. And kind of the person to blame for the reason I'm really into Shiny is probably my friend Jackson, who uh, gave a a talk when I was in my second year of PhD. He was just doing a demonstration of Plotly and Shiny. And like, there was this moment where I just went, whoa, that's so awesome. Like, I really vibe with that. Like, because when you're communicating maths concepts or stats concepts, right, those things can be pretty dry sometimes. Yes, been there, yeah. done that, yep. <laughs> So um, anytime you can think about something in this like kind of dynamic visual way, you can really take something that's really difficult to understand in this static concept and kind of make it transformative. So it was kind of this gateway for me to be like, oh, I can explain some of this stuff in real time to people in presentations and like even supervisor meetings to be able to take stuff and be like, this is how two things interact with each other. And if we change this, this happens. And yeah. So that's that's kind of how I went down the rabbit hole. It's amazing how sometimes it just takes that one showcase of functionality or, you know, in that in that case, things like Plotly, which is one of my favorite packages. It just gives you that light bulb moment of like, not only is it exciting to see as like a viewer of it, but then you think, okay, now I can actually use this to my advantage and start using it in whatever role I'm in. And, and certainly I can identify very well with trying to educate others on very difficult concepts and stats or data science or things like that. So it, it's awesome to see, you know, people pick up something like shiny, which can be probably a little intimidating at first, but then when you start small and you think about, yeah. you know, the possibilities, you, the, it's, it's so much more you can do with it. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like, um, when I first started, I was probably like, no one was there to rein me in. So I was just this big dreamer. I was like, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. And my friend Jackson was great because I could just be like, help me figure this out. Like, let's work and, figure, and um, figure it out. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, very, very <laughs> cool. Um, so speaking of uses of Shiny, so as I mentioned at, at the intro, um, I've been you know, very privileged that this year I was a judge for the shiny contest this year. And lo and behold, your submission came in one of my uh, set of 15 or so to, to look at. And I was really amazed at, at the end product and kind of the, the novelty of what you were trying to show. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, your application, kind of what you, what you were thinking of when you were designing it and what gave you the inspiration to create it. Yeah, so um, I actually did my postdoc in the Netherlands and the Netherlands and Australia are quite far away from each other. And um, when kind of the outset of the pandemic happened, like it was really clear that 
like borders were starting to shut and there was this moment where I kind of got locked out of my own country for a while Ooh. and like it was kind of this kind of like really high uncertainty and we started working from home and like you were just consuming so much every day around like what was coming and what was happening and I and I just had this itch like I really wanted to do something and um I probably know enough maths and stats to be dangerous in this space, but not really super educated. So I was like, I don't want to like, there was this temptation to do some web scraping and data viz and other things. And I was like, no, I've, I'm going to channel my energies into something else that feels more creative. And um, there was this, I, I saw a couple of really interesting visualizations and I was trying to figure out the interplay of how you would want to visualize this. Like, how would you want to, um, explain this to people like if I had to explain this to my mom or someone or like if I was wanting to like share this with school kids to help them understand this interplay between like susceptible individuals and infected and recovered how would you even do that and um around the same time I saw this like Twitter trend of like five jobs you had before you became a scientist or something like this and I was like thinking back to the like dark recesses of the past and like when I was really young I used to go to my mum's physiotherapy all the time and we'd play Minesweeper. Well, I'd play Minesweeper. I was meant to be helping her do admin stuff, but I well, was know. just playing a lot of Minesweeper instead. You're probably not the first that would boot yeah. up in opportunities like that. <laughs> but I, um, I really like that idea of like having hidden people in the population that you kind of had to uncover. And so there was this kind of easy bridge to make between you know, this kind of traditional game format where you are discovering or you were discovering hidden objects and this idea of trying to discover hidden individuals through testing. And then that kind of allowed me to like start to think about how I'd want to visualize the problem. Um, yeah. And I, it's a very organic project. So like maybe I started with that in mind. And then as you mm -hmm. start to code this thing up, you're like, oh, wait. So there's like tons of things you have to think about in terms of how different features interact with each other. Yes. What, are you gonna, what are the rules? Like, how do you win? And like, yeah, weird things like that. You don't realize till you start. Yeah, that's been a lot of experiences I've had. I have a, an idea kind of an abstract on paper, so to speak. And when I start fleshing things out, it's like, no, I didn't consider that. I didn't consider to use a try in this. Um, I, I remember my first contest submission of a, a couple of years ago with a Lego mosaic maker. You know, I thought, oh, they just upload a picture. That's it, right? Oh, there's way more than just that involved. <laughs> like if someone actually wanted to buy the pieces, like what? how am I going to tell them what to buy? So it's it's all yeah. a lot of the design thinking that as just a traditional R user, I never even had to consider. But when you start developing something that's going to be put in the hands of those that maybe some don't even want to care about programming you just want to use whatever you're making it's a different perspective um for sure yeah yeah so let's um let's see what the app looks like in action so um, i think you've got a demo set up for us so let's uh take a look yeah so i didn't like you can go really far with your user interface stuff and i suppose i just wanted to keep it really simple um like i I kind of have this like hardcore nostalgia about the traditional Minesweeper. So there's part of that in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't want all the bells and whistles. I just wanted something with that kind of did the base job with functionality. And this is it here. Um, the simple idea is that like all these circles are people and um, what you can do is you can use your mouse cursor to click to see if this individual is infected or not. Um, and you can see that come up. And what happens with every mouse click is you start a new day and upon that new day new people can be infected and you can see this hidden counter has gone up now there are eight people in this grid who are infected with the virus mm -hmm. and you can continue to click around and you can test and you can see this hidden counter going up um and eventually you see something like this happen and I've tried to make this as close to reality as possible in a lot of ways because I, I wanted people to kind of understand this interplay of testing and quarantine. So what happens is when you develop symptoms as an individual, I'm assuming that you go and get tested and you send yourself to quarantine. And that's what happens here. So you can see this red person here is now infected mm -hmm. and um, that person and their four closest neighbours have gone into quarantine together. 
Um, and basically the idea of the game is that you want to find all 31 hidden infections. And now you can see that one person is shown. So you found one of those infections. Um, so my intention now is to keep testing. And if I find somebody who hasn't showed symptoms yet, but I test them, then they go into quarantine as well. So you can see that if I continue to click around, you can find this virus spreading. It sure is, yep. So there were four initial seeds here. And after eight days, we have 45 infections. And you can kind of control the probability of infection down the bottom here. And this 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 slide is a bit ridiculous because if you whack that probability up to like 0 0.5, like the whole board goes red in like all of about 30 seconds. Ooh, and if you like yeah. make the probability really low, you could be testing around. It just doesn't matter. You'd win even if you weren't testing in a like strategic kind of way. Right. So it's interesting to see this, this like interplay of that probability with how this infection happens within the population. Um, Shall I see if I can win my own game now, or is this going to be? Let's do it. Yeah, push the yeah. envelope here. <laughs> oh no! Yeah. Um, oh, you're getting. Uh, let's see, yeah, you got yeah. 37 hidden now. Yep. It's, it's uh. You're, it's getting closer. <laughs> a lot of uh, red happening. There's such an element of randomness to all of this, right? Because, oh, absolutely. Um, Okay. Because even if you test in an optimal way, like these are random variables. So things are happening in such a way that even if you played the best game you could possibly play, you could lose because it's a random simulation behind the, you could just get really unlucky. Yeah. So I also kind of like that element of it, that mm -hmm. there's this winning against a virus is a, is a bit of a misnomer. It's, it's not a, a simple concept and, a lot of ways so it made thinking about what did it mean to win quite a difficult um quite a difficult thing to think about absolutely and you, might, you might notice now that there's some people in quarantine here who i haven't tested who maybe haven't shown symptoms yet um and this count is going down um so hopefully these hidden infections are just these people who are already in quarantine and you can see some of these have started to recover right so, right yeah now we got 13. Oh, nope, we're you know. yeah, I think I think I'm gonna win. Yeah, um, so looking promising. Okay, we're at four. <laughs> okay, I think you've got it. Maybe yeah. a couple more clicks I, I in there. It's someone who's already in quarantine. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. That that's that's really fun. And, and to be honest, that could be quite addicting to see how often you can win this. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um... Yeah, it's it's totally ridiculous, but like I just needed to do something in early, like early lockdown that was a creative outlet to deal with all of this information I was having thrown at me because I, I really made this in April of 2020, and then I wrote the documentation like late last year. Um, so. Oh, so yeah. this has been in the in the kitchen for a while, so to speak. This is cool. Yeah. yeah. And it it definitely, I mean as as we've been living through this for over a year now there is that it seems like random occurrences of this and you know yeah. whether and we like it or not this is a phenomenon that's happening with with the way the the virus is spreading so i mean yeah you you got a nice uh fun accessible way to learn about this but this is really happening and it does seem a lot of times quite random depending on your perspective so <laughs> it's a really like for me as a developer too it was really weird because like i had this idea and then i implemented it and then i played my own game and i was like what i don't actually know what the optimal strategy for players like i created right. this thing without like how should I test so I can kind of win? Like, what's the best way for me to do that? And you, like, you probably saw me clicking around and it might've looked pretty random, but <laughs> there's, there's actual strategy going on there in terms of like how you interact with this gameplay and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a, that's a great segue. Um, I'd love to know kind of some of the techniques and principles you did to, uh, to create this app. So we believe you have a document prepared for us to kind of dive into that further. So as I said earlier, like I was in the Netherlands when the pandemic started and then I kind of got locked out of my own country for a while. And um, eventually I made it back home in 
like November of 2020, Australia was doing like mandatory quarantine. So I got locked in a hotel room for two weeks. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And that was kind of like, it'd been a stressful year. So I kind of loved it. Like I, it was like this weird, like, um, but while I was in quarantine, that gave me a chance to actually finish the documentation for the game, which I'd created. And um, I tried to create this kind of tutorial document that was super accessible for everybody who might be a kind of beginner and shiny who would want to come and have a play um, and just kind of talk through the different aspects of all the pieces that kind of go into creating something like this. And there's, yeah, so you can kind of see the broad headers atop, across the top here. You have to have some like game rules. Um, there's the base R setup. There's how these virus dynamics are going to work in the game. There's kind of this design and then there's the shiny end um, and then there's just the fab about like kind of how the final game works as well as um, kind of why why someone who works in statistical climatology got bored and decided to make a, a shiny game. So yeah, I suppose ahead. you kind of got an idea before um, when we were playing that you kind of had these three states you could be in, this kind of susceptible state or your infected state and your recovered state. Um, and there's also kind of a hidden state in the back end. So each of those things kind of had to be set up to start and kind of figure out how they were going to interact with each other. So quarantine as well. How would you want to catch the virus? How did he, we even want to think about testing and this process of symptoms and recovery? Um, going into R, I kind of, I set up like all these different states. So you have some set of infection levels and then... I, you have some set of infection labels that are going to be used later when you, um, like it's easy for me to say SINR where I'm coding internally, but you want to have these nice labels for when you spit it out at the end. Absolutely. Um, so this code is all really just about setting up um, those initial states in a really nice, simple way. I'm interested, especially in the parts where you kind of did the the random you know, assignment, if you will, uh, on the event. So if, if you want to find that, that's great. If, if we can do okay. something else, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So there's kind of this static initial process that gets set up here. That's all initialization code. Okay, so let's look at virus dynamics. So I tr like figuring out the order that these things happen in, like is, was quite tricky. It's it's non-trivial because all of these game things flow on from one another. So once you have one, the next one happens. Yeah, you have to decide how big your board is in terms of I and J. So I just set up some initial grid that was going to represent all of our different people. And I initialized everybody is susceptible to start with. So, mm -hmm. And that's what you see when you start the game. That's that shown layer of what everyone's exposure state is. And then to begin the game, I kind of just seed four random infections that are just randomly sampled across the entire board. And those four people start out as infectious. And you can see that I have this, so you have this shown state, which is what the game viewer gets to see. And you have this hidden state, which is actually the true state of what the infection are behind the scenes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then you have some other statuses here in terms of your quarantine and your testing, which we also keep track of and we use later, but I suppose part of what in is interesting in this, you also have to set up how long uh, you need to keep track of how long a person has been infected for because you need to show when these kind of symptoms come out and when that person is going to recover. And kind of in a lot of this traditional like SIR modelling, um, we'd simulate those with like a Poisson random variable. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of to start with, even if, people weren't going to get infected, just initialized everybody with some time that if till their symptoms would show until they would get recovered. So those things are kind of your symptoms and your recovery down here. And all of this kind of information about what people's infection status is, whether they're in quarantine or not, whether they have been tested, whether they're like what their hidden status is, um, how long they've been infected, all of that just goes into some initial data frame that puts all of this together so we can start off. And I've tried to split this out in such a way that 
yeah, you have your reactivity in other places, but this function can be kind of accessed and used without needing to worry about some of that other more technical shiny detail to start off with. Yeah, and you're following a best practice here. Of this is what I'll call business logic of the application, right? And you factored out a piece that technically could be run outside of shiny and that makes it easier for you to extend this function later on without your application code itself being intertwined with making tweaks to this um, specific uh, uh, random assignment and processing. So yeah, I think it's a great design choice. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So I suppose the kind of next things to talk about how you um, how you simulate this gameplay. So the intention is every time you click, something new is going to happen. So you get these, uh, you increase this counter on your infection period. You're going to have these new exposures. You have to update your new infections, reveal those people with symptoms, reveal those who's recovered, um, show the people who get test, who the person who you tested, and kind of quarantine anyone who's been exposed. So that's kind of the next step and how we do all these things. And again. I think we can wrap all of this kind of quite nicely um, in a function that says updated person statuses. So you can, again, this kind of more static version of the code can be wrapped together and held separately that you can, like, you know that you're going to create reactivity in this later, but you can keep all of that together in a, a simpler way as well. Um, Probably the interesting part of this is how we deal with people getting infected. And I didn't right. mention it before, but um, we set this up so that your closest neighbors are the ones that you can catch it from. Um, so your top, your bottom, your left, and your right. And I think I did too many like PDAs lectures in third year math or something. So <laughs> for whatever bizarre reason, from a design perspective, I decided this board should be on a torus. So it wraps top to bottom and left to right, which kind of makes the gameplay a little bit more interesting because someone on the left of the board is infected can kind of infect someone on the right. So you have different spread dynamics. And if you'd had this hard boundary that had stopped people from, um, it would, it would make the gameplay too easy. And I mean, sure. basically, so we now play on a Taurus. So well, that's, it's another hint of kind of the real world scenario, like boundaries sometimes don't exist and you know, things can happen. Yeah. So, yep. You've got, you've got movement, you've got migration. So, yes. um, there's this other function there. So there's kind of three functions of this, this shiny app leverages, this kind of get neighbors function, this like initialized person statuses function. And, um, then this, this update person statuses function. So this, the infection process. And um, that kind of infection process, I wanted to be like, again, like if you think about you and I have a contact or it's not possible because we're on Zoom, but if we were in the same room together and I was like flicking a coin to say, oh, I've got, I'm sick. What's the probably you get sick from me? I have some basic infection probability there. And you can just do that as a simple binomial random variable. So I can take all the people who've been exposed or had a contact and I can simulate whether they're going to have a new infection or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a bit mean. So if you have multiple contacts, well, I, well, not mean, realistic, but you have multiple contacts, you're more likely to catch your virus there. So yeah, makes sense. You have this kind of multiplicative effect, which is dealt with kind of in here. Right, right. Through filling out your unique ones. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else you, I should flesh out there that you think I, um, I'm Oh, the, sure. no, this is, this is a great overview of kind of what okay. I'll call the, the pre setup, you know, getting things initialized and then what's happening in the, in the processing side when the user interacts with it. I'm certainly curious when you, when you get to the app itself and that visual of the game board, how did you handle the user registering those clicks and how did you tie it back to the logic that you just presented here? Yeah, so, um, so I, like as I said before, I really tried to keep this like compartmentalized, all these different pieces. So like that whole setup now can really be condensed into these kind of two kind of sets where you have like your initialization here of all the different things that are going 
into play that we're going to need all these different infection labels, what's going to go on our graph, like our board graph at the end. Um, how big is your board? What, how long are you, uh, like, wait until you show your symptoms, how long you recover for? So all these initial stuff gets grouped together. And then you've just now got these four functions which basically contain everything um, that we looked at before in terms of um, setting everything up. So what that meant was you could get away with um, some really basic shiny to make this whole thing work like it there's nothing fancy about what's going like I've seen some of the amazing submissions for the shiny context this year and I was absolutely blown away and there's um I feel like I've picked really simple shiny elements like you you're picking a mouse click you're picking a a slider you're picking like I like that's basically it and you're just using these flow on so um yeah yeah, it doesn't have to be complicated, right? Um, and what I love about what your your output or plot output container here is this is a technique I do all the time. It's very tempting to put all that verbose logic in the render plot, but when you have a, a simple function produce board plot, this again will make the bugging a lot easier and a lot easier for you to reason with if you make changes. So again, I it this little server, I mean, it's really not many lines of code, right? But it's really just calls yep. to other functions and it's a wrapper to certain things and too many times and not that you were intending to show this but i think this is a great showcase of you don't have to be this expert level of mastering all the ins and outs of shiny to follow principles like this in a very simple but yet um contained way of running that logic so from a just a development standpoint this looks really terrific to be able to can conceptualize that very um succinctly yeah um and i suppose i always had this kind of like really like early shiny user in mind when i was writing all of this and i wanted them to be able to not get overwhelmed as they go through so this tutorial is really written so that um like you can see this basic shiny input of your ui and your server and like you're just starting to bring in little pieces of the important information as you go through so like if like this is just an example of how to get your static plot there ready right. to kind of go. And then you in, I'm introducing like really simple mouse click and reactivity, like one thing at a time. So like just trying to explain to people this simple step through of like, you know, here's your basic board and like we weren't doing anything here and now we're going to take that next step of we're just going to change this one line here and now magically you have a plot click and like this – you're starting to play in China, even though you've changed one line of code, basically. So it's kind of, I, I think it's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love this approach to explaining it in, in the document. You're taking an iterative approach here. This is actually something I'm trying to make easier for developers like yourself, creating these applications to um, be able to explain the different stages of the app, you know, in a nice way. I have a package I'm working on as I speak. I haven't finalized the, the the final name of it yet, but I'm calling it Shiny Learning for whatever reason, yeah. so that you can have one app, like one running app, but yet it has these individual tabs inside that shows like the evolution of it, maybe from like your prototyping stage all the way to when you say polish it up for release, whatever it's for our contests or production or whatever have you. So this narrative here is actually a great example that I can learn from of how you approach it. So that, this is really cool. Oh, that's nice. No, yeah, that's nice of you to say. I um, I feel like I could only write it in this way because I wrote it the hard way to start off with. So like you do the, you create the app and then afterwards you're like, oh, this was the easy way. If I could like <laughs> have the shortcut cheat sheet, this is what I would want people to know. So you you have no <laughs> idea how many times I've encountered that myself. Of like, oh, why did I do it that way? I I just had to go through it the hard way once to make it really stick, and then now I know the shortcuts or I know the the more um, optimal way of, of constructing things. So it's a way a lot of us learn in this, in this area. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I suppose like, yeah, just trying to show people like, this is all you need now. You've got one plot click. And then the next step here is we want 
some things to react when we have a plot click. So we want to have kind of these coordinates of knowing where we're going to test. And we also want to have this like data frame of our people update with these kind of hidden states updating and what we're seeing as visual output up changing as well. So you now have those, you've introduced two new reactive variables. Um, yeah. Yep, and then now you've got a deal with, okay, we got to track that mouse click, and yes, observe event. Okay. I use this every single app, whether it's a button click or some other server processing that I need to keep track of, some event, some trigger. And so yeah. this is a, a perfect case for that. Yep, and it's, um, I like, again, it's, like, super simple. Like, we've got our game board, we've now got our variables, and now we've got our mouse click. So now we're getting our test coordinates, and we can simulate these new infections and update these infection statuses from that function we wrote before. And it's all really nicely contained, really readable, really easy to engage with. And if you're a basic R user, there's not a huge jump here, I don't think, like, which I, I really, I really like. And I feel like the jump isn't huge because we did all this hard work in the beginning to kind of create this function, update person statuses to do the simulation of the infection. So Yep. It's, it's another really another thing I, I may mention in earlier, but I want to say it again, getting that work up front done outside the app is not only good practice technically, it just honestly makes your life so much easier as you scope the rest of this out. You don't want to get confounded by issues of Shiny itself with issues in kind of the more logic, the more heavy lifting parts of your app that technically don't depend on it. If you confound the two, it, take it from somebody who learned the hard way. Like I said, it's a lot, a lot more difficult to reason through it. So get the get the hard part stuff out of the way that doesn't depend on the on the web interaction pieces of it. And that's yeah. what that's what you've done here very well. So yeah, ex yeah, absolutely, exactly. Like I'm so good at breaking stuff. I manage to break stuff all the time, and the easier you can do bug <laughs> stuff, like the better. Like, yeah, it's a rite yeah. of passage, especially in the world yeah. of shiny. Break everything, right? <laughs> break everything. Yeah. I feel like that's one of my best life skills. I wish I could put it on my resume. And then like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I have that. I have that in spades of everything I build. So yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> so the infection probability was a bit of an afterthought, actually. I think mm. I added this in a bit later because um, initially I just had it fixed. And like, I suppose for me within this game and this design of like where I wanted to go with it, there's... Um, like you could do so many different things. You could change how that contact network worked. You could you could tweak that function like get neighbors. Um, so you could change who got infected from who. You could um, and like I suppose just I thought it was important that people could see this interplay of the spread through changing this slider dynamic. Like it wasn't just enough to have people click and play with a static probability anymore. Like we're seeing these new variants come on that are way more infectious, and you need to understand that if that contact risk of you and I goes up. What does that actually mean? And right. yeah, and I suppose like, as I said before, it's a bit ridiculous for me to say that the max value on this slider input would be 0 0.5. Like everybody's infected at that point, but it's kind of interesting to see what happens when everybody gets infected. I think that's a, a good um Yeah, it, 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 it makes awareness of just how prevalent this is. And, and the fact that it's a lot of these things, sometimes we have to see an earlier stage of the app and even us developing and yeah. becoming like the user, it's like two personas. And sometimes that other persona just didn't quite understand what the user persona is going to want to do. And then you just go back and add it in later. But it's obviously the power of shiny makes it easy to put that in when you when you see fit. So yeah, it was and it again, because all that stuff, all that setup had been done so nicely, it's it's one line in your UI here, You're like, boom, that's it. Now I've got a slider. And um, the like small tweak here was that like, now we need to update kind of this data frame. We want it to reset when we reset our slider. Right. Basically, we want to start the game afresh. And um, again, back to our favorite observe event yep. type. Uh, Tried and true. Yeah. <laughs> Tried and true. Yeah. Um, and then again, you just need to make sure that that new infection probability, that new 
kind of reactive variable is passed through to the right function. So you've got three, I, I just, I love the simplicity of it. I love the cleanness of it. I love that you can, yeah, I think it's really cool that I could have this like dynamic game idea that can be really simply implemented with a few tweaks of lines of code, yeah. Yeah, I have some uh, friends in the Shiny community that are trying to learn by creating kind of clever game-like ideas and I'll point them to this, be like, hey, this is the approach yeah. Kate took, you know, it might help you out too, yep. This isn't so, like, this isn't dynamic, but I thought, like, I wrote the big tutorial doc, right? But most people aren't ever going to read that. Most people don't even read the rules anyway, but um, oh, I, I know, thought it would right. be nice if there was a, a bit of rule text down the bottom and I tried to keep it pretty simple and stuff. Um, yep. I didn't bother to paste it in full in the tutorial document, but you, you get the general gist. Did you read the rules, Eric? Were uh, you, uh... I, I like to read the rules. I, I, I have respect oh, okay. for people that actually put it in there, so, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So this was, um, yeah, I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to win this game. It's a weird context when you start to talk about winning. Right. Um, and I suppose I picked some arbitrary like threshold of too many people being infected because I wanted that to mirror that kind of like overwhelming of our hospital systems. And that was kind of where the winning of the game came from. I'm not sure if I love that. Like I did experiment with having like a, instead of, so at the top before you saw those numbers, which are like um, how many people are infected, how many people are hidden, how many are recovered that kind of help the user keep track and to amend their testing strategy too. Because if you see a ton of people are infected, you kind of got to guess a bigger radius away from your current affected people to in, like force people into quarantine faster. There's some nice strategy that you really can inform by having these numbers at the top. They help you play. Um yeah, and I, I did think about it doing doing this visually with some kind of like bar on the side that would increase proportionally with how many people were infected or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did experiment with that. But in the end, this kind of simple counter did did an effective job. And um, I, I, I kind of like that better. I, I can't explain why. But um, yeah, so again, you kind of need this counter that you're going to keep track of how many days you've been playing for or um, that helps you index things as you go along yeah. for your kind of symptom period, your recovery period, your infection period, all of those kind of things. Um, and you need to have these reactive values that you can spit out the top as some form of text if you want to. Yeah, it, it's um, it's extra bookkeeping, but in the, in the, the best way because it's going to be dynamic based on the events. And then it's up to yeah. you to do what you want with that information. So I think it's cool that you have that little mini stat ticker at the top kind of showing them the real-time status. Yeah. Um, so you just kept them in this very game summary. And then you have this game win or game lose. So, like, you win if you find everyone who you've seen as infected is no longer hidden anymore. You found them all mm -hmm. and you, you kind of lose if too many people get infected here. So some percentage cut off. Um, and this was new to me. Like I wanted some like kind of pop up to say, Hey, you've won or Hey, you've lost or like, sorry, better luck next time. And um, I use this package shiny alert uh, to do that, which is again, super simple to kind of add in here, you just add one line and now you have the capacity to put in a pop-up box. That's it. Yep. Piece Shiny case. Alert's one of my favorites uh, from good friend of the show, Dean Natale, um, previous guest yep. of the Dev Series, and he does great work and great to use a package to its uh, best use case here, just to set the pop-up. Yep. Um, yeah, so basically, again, you you click the mouse, did you win, did you lose, did, did something happen? And yeah, they just have a little if statement now that um, can contain those things. And the, the little pop-up boxes are great. Like I can say there's already an option to generate this kind of fun tick there. I didn't even need to do that myself. And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, it's like, it, it, I'm trying to learn sometimes a little bit under the hood of these, but boy, when you're when you're just trying stuff out for the first time, the ecosystem of what you have um, at your at your choices here outside of the shiny package itself. I'm like, I, I said this in the dev series before, I'm like a chef. I'm just mixing ingredients from different packages into this product or this this uh, 
recipe of, yeah. of the app and it's great to have choices to make it easier for you so you can get on with the actual design of your app without getting uh knee deep into css all the time or things like that yeah yeah exactly um yeah it's, it's super easy to engage with um yeah and I, I added the text up the top to tell you where you're like where you're at with your game as well so that kind of right. summary text um which then is now some render text object within the shiny and um yeah so I, i've really tried quite hard to like separate these chunks out so you can kind of read this through as a starter and go oh okay well she's done this here and this here and these pieces kind of come together slowly and it's not this big mass of some shiny out that you like don't feel like you can kind of even start to engage with um uh and then the yeah so it's really funny because I, like i say that these things are simple right but the second you start to play with any of this interactivity or you do stuff then AFXB and BFXC and CFXD, and you're like, oh, I don't, are we at F? Like, ah, oh. um, yeah. So you change your slider and um, you've got to remember to update or reinitialize your whole game in a way. Yeah, but yeah. It, the, just seeing this narrative shows the, the evolution of your personal learning process throughout this. And yeah, you you sometimes all know that this this little input or this little logic I'm going to put in here has a downstream effect until you actually try it and see for yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, or until you forget to update that interactivity and it breaks and you're probably yes. like, what? No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Those are some of the hardest of the bug or when you do something that was supposed to interact and absolutely nothing happens, then you realize, oh boy, I forgot the references, this input or this reactive and it's uh, back to the drawing board sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's very, very funny. And that, like, that's literally it. So, like, I think that's, you've really gone through, like, this basic shiny setup to get your board the way you want it to look, this, like, mouse click and reactivity, uh, adding in some infection probability with the slider, adding in some rules, adding in that pop-up uh, and some summary stats. And you're done. And so you've got six little nice compartmentalized steps or whatever number it is, and you're sweet and you're good to go. It yeah. is just that easy. Well, not quite <laughs> easy, but you know, I couldn't resist. But boy, I no. sure I sure love the uh I love the narrative around it. Um and we'll definitely have a link to this document in the show notes because I think it's a it, it it's it fleshes out the entire story of it. The app looks deceptively simple but when you start when you look at it from the surface but then when you dive into the details you see your design thinking in action so again i love the approach and you've given me another great kind of example of where i want to go with my personal uh, learning project so this has been yeah. really fun yeah um so yeah i'm one thing i'd like to pick your brain about is obviously you've you you you've used shiny before you've used art quite a bit in your work um what were some learnings you took from this experience that you're able to apply to things you're working on in your in your role of teaching and the like uh i like i really love being able to use interactive stuff when i particularly when i present like i present really niche probability topics that are super important. Like we all care about climate change. We care about climate extremes and how are you going to explain some of that stuff to other people? Um, so like one of my PhD topics was actually about clustering and clustering is quite a dynamic process, right? You're changing yes. the number of clusters you have and that has some flow on effect. And if you're fitting some model on top of that, so you have all these different processes and maybe you're also wanting to visualize the kind of strength of association within these clusters. So I had this really beautiful um, shiny app that I created for that, that kind of allowed me to change the number of clusters on the fly while I was talking to people about this like climate application that they could see this updating process. Mm -hmm. So you, you get to have, so I can put an equation up all day long. That's great. And like, if you've seen the equation before, you're probably going to be like, yeah, sweet. But if you haven't, you're like, uh, I, like it's, it's very hard to develop that kind of intuition for something. Whereas mm -hmm. if you can see it move dynamically. So that's kind of how I've used it in my research 
in the past. Um, I think that went down really well, great effect. I'm quite interested in, say, um, some of the learn R stuff at the moment for my itty bitty first years. Yes, um, um, a lot of great uh, praise for learn R. I've used it a little bit in the past. Um, I have uh, colleagues that have used it to actually explain how they, how someone would use their package, an interactive walkthrough, yeah. where it tests their knowledge and not in a bad way, of course, but just reinforces certain principles. And it's been great for the uptake of how they use that particular package, or frankly, some even use it with tidy evaluation, which is one of the hardest things yeah. to teach in the R world. Yeah. So um, I definitely, yeah, I, I like that kind of stuff. I um, So this is my first year teaching at QUT. So it's been just a keep your head above water situation. Oh, I bet. Uh, <laughs> get a see of like online teaching in the pandemic. But um, going into next year, I'm looking, I'm really looking at places in the course where you could kind of take some like concept and be like, oh, I'm going to make that dynamic. And you guys are going to be able to get your teeth into it in a whole different way. Um, yeah. I suppose uh, things like random simulation and um, other kinds of like uh, fitting linear regressions and looking at like where your residuals are. And there's lots of ways you can make this stuff more engaging in like we, traditional statistics. Like, I'll be honest, I, I did a lot of maths in my undergrad. I didn't do a lot of stats. I was like, boring. I want to do other things. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to everyone out there. Please don't like. I don't there think I... you're alone in, in thinking that yeah. stuff is boring, especially how it's typically taught. And that's that's a hot take, yeah. I guess. But um, hopefully now there are more resources yeah. to make that more engaging. So <laughs> yeah, the choice. So yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to get at. Like we could um, we could definitely engage with material in a new way now that makes like helps people to understand why it's important and to like sink their teeth into it who potentially wouldn't come from a traditional like more mathsy stats perspective yeah yeah anyway yeah, I, that, that's, that's, a, that's an awesome way to, to summarize it and and certainly i try to use technology like shiny and other uh, more dynamic uh, tech to my advantage to distill some complicated things but boy i'm um, talking about teaching when i was uh, in graduate school most of the time I was supporting the statistics computation lab where I was actually helping people with projects, how to install custom things, build custom things for clients of, of the school. And then the semesters I had to teach, oh man, I feel so bad for my students because it was so boring. <laughs> we didn't have shiny back then, folks. There was not much I could do. Yeah. Um, I tried to <laughs> put pretty pictures and slides, but even that didn't cut it. So. Like you said, with things like LearnR and just the the ways you can approach um, teaching the math and the stats behind these, um, why we why we have the central limit theorem or why we have different estimator yeah, exactly. properties, it's it, it's so much better now than it was in the yeah. past. So I it's think much better. I, I think yeah. what what you've done in, in your in your submission to the contest as well as what you've alluded to and what you're trying to do in your teaching, I think it's a great inspiration for for others yeah. to follow as well. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Yeah. yeah, I think it's um, it's pretty hard to like tune out in a lecture when things are moving dynamically on the slide. So uh, <laughs> gotta gotta use all the tricks in my wheelhouse, you know. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I remember I had some tricks to keep the students awake, and some of them were uh, uh, more uh, well received than others. But at least I tried, you know. You know yeah. <laughs> limited tech I have. Um, yeah. Well, it's been it's been a pleasure talking with you, Kate, uh, and diving deep into, like I said. An application of looks deceptively simple on the surface, but you you definitely walk us through a lot of great design thinking, a lot of great logic and reasoning. Um, if others are curious about this app and want to ask you more about it, um, what would be the best way that they could get a hold of you? Oh, they can definitely like they can DM me on Twitter or they can pop me an email. Like um this is this is very much a labor of love, right? Like this is not my bread and butter research, but like when you when you need a creative outlet, you need a creative outlet. So um, but I what I like about it is there's actually a lot of areas where like you could potentially tweak the gameplay a little bit. Like even mm, yeah. replaying it before today, I was like, oh, it'd be really cool if the alpha level of your testing faded out as it became a res less relevant piece of information to you as a game player. Or like, as I said before, it'd be cool if you could tweak your contact networks or, um, yeah, or even like thinking about visualizing 
um, <clears throat> yeah, that septable infected recovered relation that I have at the top, like maybe there's a nicer way for me to think about doing that. So if people are like, whoa, that's really cool. I want to engage and I want to extend and like, go for it. You can, um, you can find the GitHub repo and you can have a look at some of the issues I flagged as extensions I might like to do as a game. Yeah, I'm totally down for that. Oh, perfect. Yep. We'll have a link to the GitHub repo in the show notes. And um, you never know, maybe I'll take a look at it for a spin. Oh, Who yeah. knows? Um, I always yeah. like to get more content out of exploring cool stuff in the in shiny space. So, well, <laughs> yeah. like I said, Kate, it's been a pleasure to virtually meet you and talk with you about this oh. uh, great, great application and your thought process behind it. And um, certainly I wish you best of luck on your continued adventures in, in the realm of teaching and and using yep. things like R and Shiny to take that to other levels. And you're always welcome to come back anytime you want to talk about cool stuff with Shiny. Oh, I always want to talk about cool stuff in Shiny. That's uh, no brainer. But yeah, yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. All right. Yeah. So, like I said, great to have you here. And um, for those watching, if you want to see more uh, great uh, interviews we've had, um, check out the back catalog. It's all at shinydevseries.com. Also, the YouTube channel is where all the videos are posted with um, show notes on shinydevseries.com. And certainly feel free to send me your the suggested topics, maybe future guests you'd like to have on the show. You never know. I tend to be pretty vocal about asking people. And most of the time they say yes, <laughs> like Kate did over here. Um, so, yeah, don't be shy. I um, love the suggestions. And definitely if you like what you see, um, definitely keep subscribed. You never know what adventures we'll have for interviews or even my adventures or live streaming where you never know what chaos <laughs> I, I developed there. So, all right, I'm gonna close up shop here. So thanks for joining everybody and we will see you next time. See you later.